Good evening, New Hope. Thanks for joining us for Church Online tonight. Can you believe 2020 is almost half over? It's crazy. It, it feels like we have lived three years this these past five months, doesn't it? It feels like it's been a really long period of life. Um, through all of this, I really believe that God is using this current situation for His glory uh, to draw all people to Him. Through what we've gone through, there are many life lessons that we've learned through all of this. Uh, some of these lessons we've learned from, from our own mistakes and some of them from other people's mistakes. If you think about your life, and, and this, my life included, um, there's a lot of people who have been instrumental in molding and shaping you and molding and shaping me. For me, uh, these people, they've taught me a lot of life lessons and it's not always just from sitting down and teaching me something. A lot of times it's from their day-to-day -day actions and responses to life that has impacted me. So when life was difficult, when uh, the pressure was on, when temptation to do wrong was the easy path, how these people responded has really stood out to me. And so that's my question to us tonight. I want us to start thinking about how do we respond when life is difficult, when we've been mistreated, when we've been forgotten about, lied about, falsely accused. What is your response to those situations? So tonight, I wanna to share with you um, some life lessons from the, the book of Genesis and the life of Joseph. With all that Joseph happened uh, to go through, how he responded, is a powerful reminder to you and I of how we need to respond when life is difficult. So Charles Swindoll, he wrote a book titled The Life of Joseph or About Joseph. Uh, I wanna read a quick excerpt from it. Joseph certainly wasn't superhuman. He was merely a man. He never walked on water. He had no halo. He never performed a miracle. He certainly wasn't free from trouble, nor was he an untarnished or untouchable plaster saint. With the Lord's help and by his own admission, he interpreted some dreams, but he made no awesome prophecies. So far as we can determine, he never wrote any holy scripture. So then why was Joseph so great? He was great because of his faith in God that manifested itself into a magnanimous attitude towards others and his magnificent attitude towards difficulty. A strong faith leads to a good attitude. And think about this, this is powerful what he says. When those two essentials are in place, troubles become challenges to face and not reasons to quit. So let's recap the life of Joseph real quick. Joseph has a dream of his parents and his brothers bowing down to him. So then Joseph goes and he tells his brothers and they didn't like it. So they sold him as a slave and they lied to their father that he was killed by an animal. Remember, Joseph was his father's favorite. So Joseph is then bought by an Egyptian named Potiphar and Joseph begins to succeed and he's put in charge of everything except for Potiphar's wife. Shortly after, he is thrown in jail for something that he did not do. And then in jail, he rises uh, to the ranks. He like gains favor in the eyes of the warden. He's put in charge of things in jail. So he is then released. And once he's released, Joseph begins to rise again. And he put, he's in second in command of all of Egypt. So at this stage of what we're about to read in this story, Joseph has been put in charge of collecting food for all of Egypt and the, the surrounding areas during years of plenty so that there can be enough food for the years of famine. So Joseph's dad and his brothers are still alive. Joseph's dad, Jacob, he says to the, to the boys, go to Egypt and buy food for the family. When they go, they're standing before Joseph. The Bible tells us that Joseph recognized his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. So through this sequence of events that, that includes keeping one brother in shackles as the others go to get the youngest brother, the brothers finally come back to Joseph once again. And this story is so incredibly amazing. And I really encourage you to take time this week to read it. There's a lot that takes place, 
um, when you read it, look at the big picture of what God is illustrating to us. So tonight I want us to look real quickly at what is it about Joseph and his response that makes it so powerful. So turn with me to Genesis 45. We're going to start reading in verse 1. It says, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. Now remember, the, the brothers still at this point have no idea it's Joseph. Joseph begins to weep loudly, and the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, don't be distressed, don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there have been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, in verse 8, so then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Joseph had a powerful response with all that had been done to him. Sold into slavery, bought by Potiphar, falsely accused, thrown back into prison, forgotten about. He had a powerful perspective that God was working through all of it. Joseph had enough sound spiritual judgment to see what God was doing. He realized that God overruled their evil actions to accomplish his purpose. Joseph could look back on his life and realize God was faithful, that he faithfully was orchestrating things to work in his favor. As you read through his entire story in Genesis, you don't read about a guy who is focused on his problems. In our minds, we wouldn't fault him, would we? Uh, that's the usual response. We've had family mistreat us horribly. We've been falsely accused and had to pay for it. We've been forgotten about, lied about. And when those moments happen, our response usually is something like this. Why did that happen to me? When will they remember me? I can't believe this is happening to me. You're catching on. God, why are you doing this to me? God, why are, God don't you know that they mistreated me? Why are you allowing this to happen to me, God? The powerful response is this, is that Joseph realized that even though his brothers intended to harm him, God was using it for good. He realized that God was always working in his life. So instead of having this response of, woe is me, life is terrible, I have it so bad, his faith grew strong because he realized it wasn't about him. Look at verse 7. It says, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance, but God. Think about this. Joseph realized God was working in the midst of all of it. He was operating his life with this divine perspective. And so I challenge you and I with this, is that when we go through difficult circumstances, um, it flat out stinks, let's be honest. It's not easy. We go through tough things and it's painful. We wanna point fingers, we want to, you know, just lock ourselves in a room and just like, be away from everybody. Uh, I really encourage you, I challenge you to ask God to help you to have his divine perspective. A divine perspective on the situation, on life. Um, Joseph had a response of sound spiritual judgment to realize that God was working on his behalf. And, and I challenge you to choose to trust God no matter what and see life through God's lens, not your own. That is a powerful response to an evil act. Listen, let your trust be more in God than in the circumstances that surround you. So another response that Joseph had, a life lesson we can learn from him is one of mercy. Um, think about this, what's the typical response in a situation like this? We've had years of unfair treatment, uh, forgotten about, lied about, falsely accused, 
the usual response would be, let's give it back to those people who have wronged you, right? Uh, the tables are turned now, the ruling goes in your favor, and now all of a sudden, you're the, the victor and not the victim. The power's now in your hand. So you get to this moment, you, re, you have rehearsed it. Everything you've wanted to say, letting out all your frustration, your anger, your resentment, you want them to know just how bad that you have had it. You give them what they deserve. That's usual, that's expected. But that's not how Joseph responded. Joseph is saying, I know what you did was evil. You intended to harm me, but God sent me here to save your life and many others now and to come. Joseph goes on to show love and mercy, provide for his entire family. If you fast forward to chapter 50, Joseph's father, Jacob, has died. And Joseph, once again, he has to remind his brothers, years after this reunion has taken place, that it was God who sent him, and he still forgave them. He was still merciful. Even on Joseph's deathbed, he is providing for his family. Turn real quick with me in your Bible to two verses, uh, chapter, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 17, and 1 Peter 3, 9. So Romans chapter 12. Take me a while to get there. Romans 12, 17 says this. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. And then in 1 Peter, let me get there. 1 Peter 3, 9 says this. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Wow. That's a powerful verse right there that... We don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but we repay it with blessing. That's tough to do, but that's so powerful and so important to do. Think about Joseph. He wasn't overcome by the evil that had been done to him. He overcame it with good. Remember this and think about this too. Joseph didn't act like it didn't happen. He reminded his brothers they sold him into Egypt. Chapter 45, he... he talked about that. In chapter 50, Joseph called it evil. So he's not pretending like it didn't happen and just sweeping it on the rug, trying to forget about it. He's like, no, what you did was evil. You did this to me. But at some point, just like Joseph, we have to look above the situation. We have to see it from God's perspective. We have to choose to show mercy to those who have wronged us. Why? Think about this. This is so powerful because that's what's been shown to you and me through the cross of Jesus the power of the gospel of Jesus. It's difficult, but thankfully we have Christ to help us through it. Jesus has paid the way for us. He has paved the way also for us. Because of our rebellion, our sin, our choices, we forced Jesus to go through what he did. It was our sin that put Jesus on the cross, but this is what the gospel is all about. Jesus Christ showing us love, grace, mercy when we have wronged him. When we have been shown that kind of grace and mercy and forgiveness, how can we hold back against somebody else? When our debt to Jesus was insurmountable, that is what a powerful response can be in a horrible situation. Charles Swindoll also has a short part that I wanna share with you from his book. He says, Joseph's life offers us a magnificent portrayal of the grace of God. As he came to our rescue in the person of his son, Jesus, so many come to him like Joseph's guilty brothers, feeling the distance and fearing the worst from God, only to have him demonstrate incredible generosity and mercy. Instead of being blamed, we're forgiven. Instead of feeling guilty, we are freed. And instead of experiencing punishment, which we certainly deserve, we are seated at his table and served more than we can ever take in. Wow. That's so powerful. God worked through Joseph to save so many lives. And I want you to think about this. It wasn't just through 
uh, the years of famine, but for years to come. Think about this. If you turn with me quickly to Genesis 45. Actually, 46, I apologize. In verse 12, it go, this is going through the, the names of the sons of Israel, Jacob and his descendants. Um, they're listing the, the sons and the names and the grandkids and grandsons there. In verse 12 of Genesis 45, he mentions the sons of Judah and Perez. And then if you fast forward to the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 1, it goes through the genealogy of Jesus. And in that genealogy, it mentions Judah and it mentions Perez. So think about this. Even though um, that, that Joseph wasn't in the genealogy of Jesus, Judah was. And Judah was forgiven by Joseph. Judah had a son, Perez. Perez helped continue the line to Jesus. Christ was a descendant of Judah. Think about this. Your faith is not about you. Your faith is also about future generations. The choices that you and I make the decisions, the faith, the faithfulness, it is affecting future generations. Some of us will never see these future generations or know about them, but what we do today impacts them. So the heart of this story of Joseph is to be in a pit and to have a powerful response, to have evil done to us and have a merciful response, to realize it's not always about me. This, this whole thing is not just about me, but it is about the... God of the Bible and the God of my life and the story that he is writing. When I get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of people that I want to talk to. Abraham, Jesus, Moses, Moses, Paul, Joseph. Um, because of them, because of their choice to remain faithful, it has impacted me and it's impacted you. But moving forward, what about future generations after us? Will someone look at you and say, thank you for being faithful? Will someone look at me and say, thank you for being faithful? So before we pray, here's two things I want to challenge us with this before we leave. If you need God's perspective on a situation, something that you're going through or have gone through, you feel like it's impossible um, and you need God's will end on the situation. It's possible. Ask God for it. If you also need to show mercy to someone, you need to show forgiveness to someone. Someone has wronged you. They've, they've, they've been a horrible person and you need to ask God to help you forgive that person. It is possible. So let's ask God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, for always being with us. And I pray that you would help those that are going through difficult situations to trust you. That they would see the situation from your vantage point, from uh, your lens on the situation, that their trust and hope would be in you more than the, the situation and the circumstance. God, I also pray for those who are going through a difficult time and or have gone through a difficult time and it's tough to forgive somebody. Uh, that evil has been done. Lord, I pray that you would help them and their hearts to trust you and to find that forgiveness that you have given them, Lord, and to extend that to somebody else. God, there's a lot that we can learn from Joseph. We thank you for your word that is written to us that we can learn from. Help us to apply it to our life starting right now. In your name we pray, amen. New Hope, have a great week. We're praying for you. Uh, we hope to see you real soon.